Hey guys, welcome back. I wanted to make this video um, as a response to a question that I received from somebody and it's such a common question. I get this a lot and this has been hashed out online so much, um, even within my own Bujinkan organization. Um, people, there's, it's very polarizing and there's two extreme camps and view on this and they bicker back and forth. I think the majority of people are probably somewhere in the middle. But I wanted to just give you my views on this as a response to this to this question um, to maybe get you out of the box a little bit and you're thinking maybe enlighten you a, a little bit in some different perspectives. Um, I'm trying really hard to not insult anybody or not create more drama because we don't need more drama. Um, let me just start out by saying the Bujin Khan is not a martial art. The Bujin Khan is a community of martial artists who all follow our Grandmaster Soke Masake Hatsumi um, and the, the art that we train in Bujinkan Budo Taijutsu is comprised of the teachings that he has wanted to share with us that come from the Ruha that he or the, the martial schools, the old traditional schools that he inherited. Now there's nine of them that are on record that he inherited. And not everything has been shared. And as far as the Bujinkan goes, there's still this kind of guarded approach to a lot of this information. I know that Hatsumi Soke has put out so much information, but people that are close to him will tell you that he has so much more. Um, and even the ones who are now new Soke, because Hatsumi Soke has awarded Soke ship to to people for each of those nine Ruha, he's awarded them to, to some of his inner students. Um, and even them, I can't even imagine the magnitude of information that, that they now feel responsible for um, and how much they're gonna actually be sharing um, is gonna be really interesting. So it's an exciting time to be part of the Bujinkan, but I do think that this topic is, gonna, is coming up again. And I think it's a good time for us to, to take a look at this because we have to have these discussions. It's important to have these discussions. So the topic is, the question is, well, let me just, I'm gonna paraphrase this, this message real quick. Hey Darren, love your videos. Um, Interesting. Anyway, he's talking about the previous videos, but then he goes on to say that something he's really been struggling with in the Bujinkan is this, is this part about, do we follow the old teachings or should we be modernizing the teachings to meet the current demands or current dangers that exist in our society? We are no longer 16th, 15th century samurai and we are not fighting on medieval battlefields. So is it necessary for us to train on those methods that they used back then? And then he goes on to justify his question. But I think that's really kind of the, the, the base core of what he's saying. And I, and I hear this so much. Let me give you my take is, first of all, we all got into the Bujinkan for some reason. And that reason is personal to each one of us. Because I know for me, I've been in the Bujinkan over three decades. I was very young when I started here. And when I first knew, saw the Bujinkan, I was in my teens, uh, late teens, and, and started to really get into the training in my 20s and just got pursued. My reasons for training have changed so many times throughout the decades, throughout the years, as, it, as I'm sure it has for you if you've been in this art for any real big length of time. Um, so... I think these questions come at a time when people are reevaluating their reasons. Why are they in this art? And that's why I think this is healthy, that people need to approach this and not be so polarized and, and really maybe just take a step back and just consider, is this really serving what I want? Or am I doing this just because I don't know any different? Um, you know, whatever it is, but I think this discussion is good and not to be so insulted, to actually allow people to have an opinion, allow them to have a viewpoint and let's talk about that. And it's not that somebody else's viewpoint is gonna necessarily change mine, 
But as a community of martial artists, which is what we are as the Bujinkan, we should all be able to sit at the table together. And we should all be able to have our own particular views. Now, to say what is or what isn't Bujinkan, I think is built upon that view. And because the Bujinkan is not a martial art, that's where things get kind of muddy because what is it that we're doing? What, are, what is this? Bujinkan Budo Taijutsu, what is that? If you Google that or do a YouTube search, you're gonna see a million different kinds of expressions of that and interpretations of that. Even what people say, this is what the Densho says, does it? Or are you saying that this is the interpretation of the Densho that somebody else interpreted and it's their opinion on that? Because I know from my experience and knowledge, oftentimes what's in the Densho is vague. It doesn't clearly define things. So you have to rely on the interpretation of the master that's interpreting it and sharing that knowledge with you. That's the throw terms out at you, but that's the, the Taiden, Kuden, Shinden type of, of transmission that, that you're getting this body knowledge and this, this written or verbal knowledge or academic knowledge, and then you're getting this heart knowledge or this feeling, this mono and mono, this relationship knowledge that comes from the relationship, that, that depth of understanding. Getting all of that together, um, it, it goes beyond the book. So, but I think what people are used to is they're used to textbooks and Densho are not necessarily te textbooks. Now there's Densho, Makimono, there's different forms of written transmission, but a lot of that was not necessarily textbooks. It had to rely heavily on oral teaching. And what we have as Densho and Abujinkan, a lot of that stuff is actually written in basically modern times. Takamatsu Soke, uh, our current Soke's teacher, he wrote a lot of this stuff based on what he was taught. Um, so you have to look at what, what is considered historical or traditional teaching from that context or that perspective. Uh, but I want to go a little bit farther into that. that. What does that actually mean, traditional or historical versus modern? Because you hear this, oh, we need to train for modern. We need to modernize our martial art. What does that mean? And in listening to all the different people and reading all the different back and forth comments and and, and uh, considering everybody's sides, I think I think this might summarize it. Traditional or historical are the arts that came from warring periods. They came from real warfare, and through that, as the wars ended and things were codified and things were put together into into preservation, those skills, those strategies, and philosophies were passed on to few, to the next generations, but it was no longer in the context of preparing for war. It had to do more with either preserving things or, or even in a quote or in a type of way, modernizing it to meet certain current conditions. And that's where a lot of the old original sword arts turned to dueling arts and became what, what a lot of us see today as, as traditional sword arts really came from that kind of time period where uh, samurai were no longer in armor, they were in they were in clothing and the swords were lighter and faster and it was one-on-one -on -one and they would duel and you know that sort of stuff. Um, and so whole schools were built around that. Uh, things like jujitsu became judo and like you see this you see this pattern. Kenjutsu became kendo and you, you see this pattern of change taking it from the battlefield component and making it more into dueling. And competition type of mindset or self-development mindset um, or preservation. They're preserving these rituals. And that's the traditional meaning. It's a tradition. It's, it's meant to be preserved and passed. Um, but let's compare that with modern martial arts. Modern martial arts were designed to deal with modern situations, modern types of engagements. Now you have two kinds of camps in that. You have sport competition, winning tournaments, putting putting one in the win column and, and getting that trophy or winning that prize money or, or whatever, building that, that sports competitiveness type of mindset to be able to win tournaments. Then you have this other group that's 
modern combatives and, and even like things like karate and Krav Maga and some of these other arts that were designed in modern history to deal with modern types of engagements. Um, and the question is, is that should our Bujin Khan follow that same path? Should our Bujin Khan modify or should we be training in the Bujin Khan in this middle type of avenue? Um, what I, what I want to say on that is, is that really you have to look at the proving ground for that, because what are we basing that on? We see violence happen on TV, but I think for the most part, people base things on sports. They're basing things on what works in a sporting environment. They see MMA, UFC, stuff like that, and it's brutal, it's violent, and Guys get dumped on the ground and ground and pounded down or they get choked out, etc. And that's very intimidating. And when I say intimidating, I mean like it makes people go, oh my God, can I hold up to that? And maybe they, they step into the ring and they get their ass handed to them and they automatically ditch their training and say, oh, it's not effective because I'm not winning in this context. But again, we're talking about ancient warfare versus modern competition. It's apples and oranges, but, but I think it's important to understand the mindset. When you are training to win competitions, you have to train like an athlete. You have to mind what you eat. You have to be clear in your purpose and have absolute commitment and dedication. When I was doing competitions back in my younger days, I trained six, seven days a week for hours on end. And I always made sure that my weight class met the cut, that I was training. If I knew who my opponent was going to be, I was going to make sure that I studied that to know what their strengths were and weaknesses. And I trained for that. If I knew the guy was comfortable at this distance, I would make sure to either jam that distance or broaden that distance, not to be in his effective distance. I already knew all of that stuff. And I trained for that with that mindset. And once that competition was over, then it was what's next. And I trained and modified my training for that next. So it was competition to competition mindset to win that, win that event. When you contrast that with ancient warfare, those guys, those samurai, those bushi, those, those, those um, those soldiers, they trained with a with with the same drive and passion and commitment, but their lives were on the line. It was kill or be killed, or it was about um, serving their daimyo, serving their lord to achieve that result. They devoted their lives to that, so they trained constantly to be the best that they can be, so that they can win the day or defeat that person, and. That's their proving ground was, was they were either going to be victorious or they weren't. They were going to live or die or they were going to win the battle. You could live and still lose the battle, but ultimately winning that battle was their primary motivation. Over here, it's about winning the tournament. But the difference becomes is that this guy in the tournament knows he's still going to walk away. If he loses that tournament, he can go train and come back and fight again. It's just one in the loss column. He's got... A, Seldom did people go undefeated in their in their competitive careers. I mean, they are out there, but seldom do people get that way. In fact, if you look at the people that are undefeated, look at their look at their wins and losses before they went official on the record in their in their career. They've lost somewhere in there. If you sign up for a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu school, you're going to lose constantly because that's the that's how you learn. But in those ancient times, you, you can't lose. If lose is death or serious injury, which also could lead to death because over here, you get injured, you're gonna go see a doctor, he's gonna fix you. Over here, you get injured, you could still die. You could die from a broken finger if an infection sets in. I mean, there's so much to consider going into that battle. So the training is geared for that. That's why the old historical techniques had three moves in them because you had to, time was not your friend. You had to end it quick. And you didn't care as much about the, the fate of the person that you were doing it on, um, unless you needed to capture them or something. You, you really, it was 
who cares? I mean, get through the guy. Over here, you do care. There are rules. You can be disqualified. You can, who knows what. Also, the mindset. You're not really wanting to hurt this guy. You have good sportsmen like you respect your opponent. You, he's a he's he's a man like you that's that's trying to get the same objective as you, but you respect each other as athletes. That's a very different mindset. This middle ground, this modern martial arts, that's where things get tricky because you're typically not training with the idea that you have to live for this. You don't have that proving ground of a battle to a real battle, and you're not in sport competition, so your proving ground becomes a little different and it depends on the art that you're in it could be belt promotions that's your proving ground it could be um, some sort of evaluation from a coach or whatever like there's all these different kinds of ways to evaluate and prove to your you know the, of what you're doing but it gets really muddy but you still you don't have these extreme black and white win or lose live or die proving grounds in the Bujinkan, we fit in this middle part. We have a background in stuff that comes from this, but we don't have it in our current training to really prove our training works. And the mindset is different. None of us are going out there to, to fight real war. I mean, yes, there are soldiers and law enforcement and stuff that train in the Bujinkan, but their jobs have training that prepare them for that. The Bujinkan maybe helps with that or enhances it, but they have that job training already. And But their their mindset is, I think, in my opinion, a little bit more sober-minded about why they train because they, they do put their butts on the line. But it's very different than medieval battle uh, with murder and assassinations and, and open warfare and things like that with really horrific weapons and gruesome ways to, to meet all kinds of different fate. Um, but over here, losing competitions, it's okay, that, yeah, it sucks. You prepare and then you lose your competition, but then you just go back and prepare for another one and you do it. Very different mindsets, we're in this middle ground in the Bujinkan, we don't have either one. So we're in this constant, am I, am what I, is what I'm doing effective? Is, is what I'm doing legit? So what happens is, is that without this, we tend to turn to this. So. We get in the Bujinkan, we train in Kyohapo, Sanshin, Kata, all these things. And then we try to apply it in sparring and we try to apply it in the, in the tournament type of proving ground. And oftentimes we're, we're sorely surprised. And, but it's no surprise because you're trying to take a training program, or I should say program, but sources of information and training methodologies that were meant for this, we're trying to apply it in this. And that's where things get difficult. And even taking this and applying it into this can be difficult because when I say this, I mean modern martial arts in a sense that if I deal with a modern violent situation the way that these guys back in history dealt with warfare, I could end up in prison very easily. I could end up in lawsuit to lose everything. Um, the moral legal ramifications are, are huge. And same thing, if I take this and apply it into here, I'm going to end up not only disqualified, but I could also end up in jail and who knows what. And it's just, it. these are all different animals. And even though they're related, they might be the same, same type of species line somewhere in there, but they're all different. The same as a lion and a cat and a, and a, and a house cat. They're both cats, but they're just two different things. Um, because of the evolution and how they are. So you have to ask yourself, what are your goals? Why are you training? What is, what is it that you want? And then you have to ask yourself, is my training getting me there? Is it going to take me there? And is the system built for that? Number one. Number two, is the teacher that I'm training with 
going to be able to show me what I need to take me to meet my goal. So, and then there's a third part that says, am I doing what I need to do to meet my goal? So, and I'm speaking strictly in the Bujinkan, as far as the Bujinkan goes, you have to understand why you're in the Bujinkan. You have to have a clear understanding of it, why you're in it right now. It doesn't mean why you started it. Why are you in it right now? And is your expectation not matching with the current reality? So if you're suddenly feeling like you're not going to be effective on the street with what you're doing, maybe you need to step back. Maybe you need to take another type of martial arts class just to give you that raw physical skill level that maybe will help you feel confident. Or maybe you need to train with a different kind of teacher. Or maybe you yourself need to take more responsibility. Maybe that Kihon that you're practicing, you're really just kind of half-assing it and you're not really having that, that drive, that real training for life and death like these guys did back in history. Maybe you need to adopt more of that. Maybe you need to adopt more of an athlete type of mindset towards your training. Go run, go do CrossFit, go do other things to improve your conditioning, to increase your survivability just on that alone. And build some muscle because yes, it takes muscle to be able to fight. I don't care what anybody says. We're not Yoda. We don't, this whole finger touchy thing and, 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 Come on, if your ass is on the line, if your loved one is in immediate danger, you're going to need your muscles. Go build some muscles. At the same time, condition those. I'm not saying you got to be big, but build functional strength that includes range of motion, conditioning, and power delivery. You need to have all of that. And if that's not this high level finesse Budo Taijutsu stuff, so what? That will come. But right now, maybe you need that in order to be able to walk down the street safely at night. Maybe you need that just to be able to, to function in your day-to-day -day, uh, activities. Like, what if you get in a car accident and you had, to, you had to be upside down, bleeding for a long period until help comes? Can you crawl pull yourself out of this vehicle? Could you pull your child out of this vehicle? Do you have to think a little differently? If you're talking about survival, you're not talking about winning a tournament. You're talking about survival. That's what these guys thought about. And that's what these guys think about with modern martial arts too, aside from karate and, and judo and stuff like that. But you have to have that mindset of your training. This training is about survival. So you can take some things from here that help with your survival. But this is the other part that I wanted to get into. It's the dangers of modernizing the Bujinkan. That the tendency for people to do when they want to modernize things is that they pull from other things to do it. And when you do that, you're relying on either completely different martial arts skills that can interfere with the development of the Bujinkan martial arts path, or it could be untested theory, or theory that's tested in sports where the goal is different. Um, whatever it is, it could be something that can really cause you problems later on. And this is what I wanted to really kind of hit home with, is, is that, that what we consider to be traditional or historical training is no longer designed. It, the way this works is, is that back in the day, you had very young masters that were teaching people how to apply the training in the here and now for real battle that was going to happen. Where as time went on, and as the warring period started to end, these masters got older and older because they weren't dying off younger and younger. They were living longer. So they started to accrue more knowledge and wisdom and reflect on their experiences. And they shared that knowledge. They, they started to realize, hey, you know, we don't need to train this way right now. 
because we're not in that time of war and I know the damage that it causes. So how about we train this way that makes you be able to live longer so that now it's not warfare that's going to kill you. It's your lifestyle that's going to kill you. So these are ways that you can keep your body healthy, keep it in good shape and be able to live longer. And that's kind of what our current soke and even the senior Japanese, that's really what they're teaching us. It's how to live, how to live, how to live long and healthy. When you contrast that with guys that have been in sport competition for a long time, and this is my experience, but back in the day when I was in kickboxing and I did some judo and jiu-jitsu and stuff, different arts, you look at these guys that are in their 30s, 40s, 50s, they got, they're wearing knee braces, they have bad backs, they have dislocated shoulders, they have all these injuries and wounds, and the quality of life is suffering because of that. Some of those guys are even horribly out of shape because they're no longer training at that athletic kind of mindset. And so, you know, their lifestyles have created the unhealthy type of position that they're in. You get that. But if you look at that, our uh, Hatsumi Soke, you look at the different Japanese Shihan, the, those guys are all 60, 70, 80 years old, and they're in phenomenal shape. They're in such good shape. And I'm not talking like, you know, cross it, but I mean, just so healthy and they look so good. And yet you contrast that to the Western lifestyle, guys in their 40s and 50s and 60s, even in the martial art that, I, that I'm in, I'm being very careful. I really apologize if I'm insulting anybody. I don't mean it like this as far as a judgment, but it's unfortunate that we see so many unhealthy people in the Bujinkan, particularly of high rank, because then it's like, where has your training taken you? Is your training taking you to be, to, to truly live a healthy dynamic life? Or is your training just kind of been something that you did while you still continue to do things that went against it, that, that really messed you up? So, in my opinion, the people that are so polarized about the effectiveness of things, the effectiveness of the Bujin economy, should we modernize things? In my opinion, I think, I think we need to stop just having these blinders on and really start to look at things in a bigger picture. That the way that, the way that these arts were taught back in the day, at the time that we are being taught them now, even as far as the Densho, because I can't vouch for all the Densho, but I can tell you that a lot of these that were inherited by Takamatsu Soke were actually written by Takamatsu Soke or his father, you know, his teacher, etc. But they don't go all the way back. You don't see the original writings from like Koda or you know, some of those old, old grandmasters way back. You don't see writings that go all the way back from when they were actually used during warfare. This was much later. So these masters were already much older by the time this stuff got codified. So of course they're gonna teach it from that perspective as the old wise warrior, not as the, the, the guy that's still in the bloody mix. And there's a reason that they codified that to teach it that way. And I think we do a disservice when we ignore that and we think that we know better. So I think that as far as do we live in 15th, 16th century Japan? No, we don't. We live in modern times, 20, 21st century. We live in modern times. We have modern problems, but are they really that different? Sure, the weaponry might be different. The mindsets might be different. But violence is still violence. And people still need to take responsibility for themselves. It doesn't matter that we have modern medicine. Yeah, we have, we have great surgeons and doctors and you can take a whole big thing of medications and whatever. But at the end of the day, we're responsible for us. And we can learn a lot from those guys from back in the day, as far as how they took care of themselves, how they trained. 
and listen to our current teachers. So do we need to modernize that? No, in my opinion, I think we need to actually go look a little deeper into that because there's a lot of wisdom that's not being not being picked up by modern generations because we're too busy focusing on all of this. We're too busy enamored by all of this. And I think that we need to stop this short-term thinking that this middle group has and, and this other group has that we're thinking very short term. And I know it's a product of our modern culture. We're in an instant gratification culture. We click a button, we get a result. We're used to having results quick. We're not used to having to put long hours of dedicated practice into anything to develop that real skill. It takes a lot of practice to train in what the Bujinkan has in its true form, in its, in its historical information, the, the information shared and passed on through the different masters and teachers. It takes a very long time. This is not something you can just walk into and learn some curriculum and develop some skill and be effective. You have to spend long hours in training to really develop that. Very different than sports, very different than modern martial arts, where it's really just focusing on getting you some reliable skill quick that you can then apply now. But again, long-term development, short-term results, long-term results. We all live longer now. I'm in my mid fifties. Uh, Hatsumi's in his eighties. I don't know how long some of those grandmas, the former Soke ever lived, but I'm starting to kind of think that maybe Soke is probably the oldest, Soke Hatsumi is probably the oldest Soke <clears throat> that any of the Bujinkan Ruha I've ever had. And why is that? Because modern lifestyle, but also he is still doing those very same teachings that his teacher taught him, his lifestyle, is built upon that. And I think that's where we need to really get back to. We need to we need to go back to this, just like, and this is something else that I think is really cool, is why it's an exciting time to be in the Bujinkan, because now we have all these new Soke. And I can't even imagine being in their place trying to think, now I'm responsible for all this. But what I think is interesting is, is that, at least in two that I know of off the top of my head, through these Soke, that they, go directly from the Densho, the written material of the Ruha that they are soke for, they're actually sharing that and they're reading it to the students. Now, I know one has always done that. There's one in particular that has always taught by the book. Um, but just recently there was some great video where this soke was reading straight off a copy of the Den Show, exactly what it says in there. And I think this is really cool because there's a, there's, I, in my opinion, I think there's this return to the source. And I'm really hoping that the other new Soke are doing the same thing because now it's like, oh my gosh, now I'm Soke, now I represent this art. I'm going to return to the source of where it originated. I think now is a great time for this in the Bujinkan. This argument of should we modernize What's modern? Should I be training in MMA? Should I be, you know, no, you have to train in this and this. I think now's the time for people to step back and really consider the Bujikan is what it is. And if we want something else to help us with what our needs are, then we just go do it. But in my opinion, I think the danger comes when you muddy things. I think the danger comes when you try to modernize the Bujikan because it turns it into something different. And once that happens, you, you've killed it. You've killed it. It dies. So let it be what it is. If that's not satisfying you, don't be a part of it. Go do something else. Create your own art if that's what you want to do. Don't use the Bujinkan name and don't say this is Bujinkan if it's not. If you want, in your class, you want to teach grappling, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, combatives, or whatever, because you find that it has immediate value that maybe the skill sets that we learn in the Bujinkan don't develop you for that, or at least the skill sets you've been taught in the Bujinkan aren't developing you for that, so you want to incorporate that in your training, that's cool. Just separate the two. I know some great teachers who are 
high-level black belts and instructors in other martial arts, and they teach it all together, but they clearly make that definition. They say, this is this, this is this, and they, they work that. That's great. But to say that you're that Bujinkan needs this and to implement that into it, you're not the Soke. You don't have Menkyo Kaiden. You're not, you're just another student like the rest of us. I'm sorry if that offends anybody, but I don't care what rank you are, you're a student like the rest of us. And if that's what you want for you and that's what you want to teach your students, great, then make that clear separation and go for it. But to say the Bujin Khan needs this, I think I, I don't think any of us are qualified for that because none of us really know everything that the Bujin Khan has. It just simply means you haven't been taught that or you haven't been exposed to that. Now, does that also mean that what you've been taught as far as historical arts don't apply today? I, I don't necessarily agree or disagree, but I do know that that the skills that it takes, the, the development of you, your foundation, your base, the connective tissues, your balance, your structure, your movement, the natural movement, the, the, way, you, the way you move your body to, to take the line, get off the line, protect your vital parts from weapons and things like that, all that stuff factors in today. Because modern warfare hasn't really changed much. A guy wants to kill you, he's going to use every means possible to achieve that result. To think that that the way they fought each other back in the day was only one way is ridiculous. When people are trying to kill, when one man's trying to kill another man, he's also afraid of that man killing him. So the way he moved took all this into consideration. Everything is a weapon. Just because the guy has a sword doesn't mean he's going to grab a rock off the ground and smash the skull of the person. It doesn't mean he's going to grab the weapon off somebody else and use it. It doesn't mean that that he's not going to try to pile drive this guy into the muddy ground and drown him in, in his own helmet filling with water. That I mean, this is the this is the brutality of warfare. And it didn't change. Modern warfare is the same thing. Just the weapons might be different, but the mindset is still the same. The way you develop the body is still the same. And I think, I think we need to get out of our own heads in this stuff and train in the way that, if we're going to train in Bujin Khan arts, we need to train in the way that Bujin Khan arts are presented to us based on the information that we have available. And I think that's where the disconnect is happening. If you want to train in the ring and win in the ring, then go train for that. Go specialize for that. If you want to be great at ground fighting, go train with the guys that are great at ground fighting. It's your life, your martial art. You go do it. But don't say that the Bujin Khan doesn't have it or don't say that this is better than what the Bujin Khan has. No, it's just better than what you've been taught in the Bujin Khan. But it's okay. Because if you have an immediate need for that, then you're going to go do it. But understand that what's taught in the Bujin Khan is very different than how it was taught back in history. Hatsumi Soke has already done so many things that are not in line with how traditional martial arts are taught. We already know that. He's such an out-of-the-box individual already. Um, but when you train with senior Japanese who who have the Minkyo Kaido or even the new Soke ship of those arts, and they're teaching that art, I think you're going to find that they stick to those source, source documents and source teachings, present the art as authentically as they can. And they're going to do that for a reason. So who are we to say they're wrong? Or who are we to say that what they're showing is not effective for today? because they're not stupid and these guys know what they're doing and they're not going to teach you something that that is a waste of time. I mean, if you insult them or don't respect them, they're just not going to give you any time. But there's a reason that they're sharing that with you. So don't disrespect it. Just choose to be a part of it or not. It's simple. If you don't respect the teaching, don't be there for the teaching. Go do something else that adds more value. You can always come back.
takes six months and goes study hard on another martial art like BJJ or something. Why not? Instead of trying to tiptoe and play a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit there, you're not going to get far. You just want to back away from your Bujinkan training and go spend a, all this time, to, all the energy you would put into this, you can put it into this, you can have that skill set, and then if you want, you can come back and pick this up. That's okay. Then do that. But don't try to modernize what you think should be modernized just because you see a guy get his ass handed to him in a ring or you somehow are not confident in your own abilities. So I know that sounded a little harsh and I apologize, but but I do think there's some there's some clarity that needs to happen there. Um, and and again, I'm not trying to put anybody down. If they want to train in that stuff, that's cool. I see value in it. I cross train. I have other martial arts friends that teach me things. I've taken other martial arts. I like all of it. Everything has something of value. And I think to summarize this entire argument, I think to summarize all of it, or to really just kind of put it in one spot, here's my, this is my, my, core belief. This is this is Darrenism 101 right here. This is my core belief. That I can train in this art and I can study this art because I want to learn that art. All it has, I want to learn this art. I can train in this art and I want to study it and I want to learn everything this art has to offer. But if I have to protect my loved ones, my family, my country, if I have to use the, if I have to really live or die by my fighting, by my ability to, to deal with a violent situation, I'm not going to use this. I'm not going to use this. It's going to be Darren Ruha. It's going to be Darren Jutsu. And it's going to be a culmination of everything and probably stuff that I don't even know is inside me that'll just come out. So, and that that is the most key point, that none of us know what we're capable of until circumstances put you in that situation. And so you need to train for you, but at the same time, have respect for what it is that you're training in. Don't feel like you know better than, your, than, than the headmasters or the, the masters of that. But you train for you because you're responsible for you ultimately. And nobody has the right to judge you for that. If it makes you happy and it fulfills you, great. That's that's perfect. So this ran a lot longer than I wanted. Uh, if you're listening to this, that means you sat through 42, 43 minutes. And I really appreciate that. Um, I hope this was helpful. I hope this was inspiring. I hope my hope is as a community that we can stop being so just dogmatically polarizing and that we can actually come together and support each other and learn and grow together even if we all want to pursue our own kind of flavors of things let us just come together and and be happy as a community and really reflect positively what the Bujinkan is as a community of martial artists that want the betterment for ourselves, our communities, and our world, that that's Hatsumi's wish in my opinion. I think that's Hatsumi Soke's wish. That's the legacy that he's leaving. And I think it's all of us, the responsibility of all of us to, to respect that and to further that and embody that in how we conduct ourselves. So the bickering, the, this back and forth, yeah, it happens, it's cool. But at the same time, it, I, I think honestly, we need to maybe step out of our own egos for a minute um, and just try to consider each other's perspectives and see what we can learn from that or gain from that uh, and uh, and just stop stop a lot of this garbage that's going on out here and just focus on our training. We have so much we need to learn. I mean, really. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed it. Please like and subscribe. Thank you for all the support. I really like these messages. Very few people post public comments on there, which is fine. I get it. But I really like all the private messages that I get from people. So I really appreciate that. Um, and and again, if COVID, like I talk about, if COVID is allowing you to be able to train more, get out and train. Just do it. Do it. If you're stuck in your home or whatever because you can't get out and go train, 
you still have so much to train on. And I have videos that are already on my channel that talk about that, maybe give you some different things to train on. There's also other teachers out there who do phenomenal live casting and things like that. Take advantage of all of it. Just don't sit in your chair and let life go by. Um, take responsibility for you, your health, your mindset, your relationships, and your training. All of that, you are responsible for. You have the mindset of an athlete, or is that old warrior who lives and dies by their training? Why not just take all of that together and just be authentically you as a martial artist, as a Buddha, as a Buddha Deshi, as a Bugesha? Be authentically you and live from that center and ignore the naysayers, and you follow what you believe to be true for you, and don't worry about what anybody else thinks. So, thanks again, and as I always say, stay happy, stay healthy, and keep training.